just as so we know Garrett um, already, so I don't have to introduce you. <laughs> so, um, I'll then continue with uh, Jennifer, and uh, with my first question, I'll basically introduce you, or you will introduce yourself. Um, so Jennifer is from from the zone, um, and when we prepared, I asked her, so how can I introduce you? And she mentioned, don't tell my freaking long position title. I will just do this in a, in a, in a smarter way. So um, Jen, over to you. Uh, please introduce yourself and maybe also share you, your aha moment, your key takeaway from our two keynote speeches, if, if, you, if you have uh, one. And you're still on mute. Just one second, Jen, you're still on mute. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jennifer Rivas, uh, and that freaking long name, the title is like a principal technical program manager. It's it's so long on, on there, but I do so many different things uh, across the zone. Uh, I don't know if anybody kind of knows what the zone is or anything like that. But DAZN came in, in uh, about four and a half years ago in Germany and disrupted the market uh, for sports viewing you know, gave great competition to Sky. Who would have ever thought we would have been a, comp a competitor and really disrupt, you know, how sports can be purchased and watched within there. And from that point, we've become one of the biggest global streaming um, sports services in the past four and a half years. And our, we just keep on expanding and expanding as, as we go. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of my key takeaway moments, Strad, that you said was uh, around you know, everybody's creative. I've struggled with that my entire life. My husband's no. an artist. He's an artist in video games. And I worked in the video game sector before this. And he's like, always pushing me to be creative. And I'm always pushed back when I'm not a creative person. You know, I just solve problems. That's all I do. Uh, you know, but I don't do art. That's not creative. I don't, I don't think make things beautiful. But then I've realized, actually, no, I am creative. I think around problems what you said about connecting things together, connecting different ideas from other people and that collaboration, that's where my creativity and innovation comes from, not from just artistic kind of creativity. So it's made me realize there are different types of creativity out there other than what you might think is the standard one. So that was a really good takeaway going, okay, no, no, I am creative actually kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, I've been at DAZN and, and, and what I've come to realize my role is, is really kind of bringing the dreams of the business, the customers and everything like that to, to, to the people, you know, as, as a program manager, I, I just work with lots of people. I collaborate and, and bring people together and connect people together. And that's how I, 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 I um, deliver the zone and, and, and that. And, and what I've been focusing on for a long time is um, launching our new markets and, and making those more efficient and everything. And now we're, we finally have announced today that we're gonna be launching in over 200 countries uh, next in, in December. So it's a great opportunity to, to kind of fulfill my dream too of global domination through the zone, really. So <laughs> it's been great. Thank you, Jennifer. Who isn't in for world domination uh, at the end of the day? So thank you so much for uh, joining us on, on the panel today. So uh, let's continue with Stefan Heimbecher. I, I, I feel that there is some connection in from your past and your experience. Um, please introduce yourself and, and, and also share some of your background and, and experience with uh, the audience and the panel. Sure. Yeah, happy to do so. Uh, I have been in this industry, and that is the media industry, for about 30 years almost now, uh, starting working at public broadcasters, that is the IRT, uh, the research and development arm of the public broadcasters in Germany, Swiss, Switzerland, and Austria. And then for many, many years, I've been um, a director of innovations and standards at, at Sky. Uh, I, I do remember when the zone came around the corner and <laughs> disrupted everything. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, aren't those the challenges that we all, all laugh and that, that we all kind of excited about, although we typically don't ad ad admit it. Um, uh, most recently, I have been working for Imagine Communications, so still standing in the, in the same uh, industry, in the media industry, but kind of jumping over the fence from the broadcaster side to the, to the manufacturer side. And um, I've been managing the product uh, training team there and also uh, build up uh, and, and establish a whole new 
uh, advisory services arm for EMEA and EPEC at the time. So I've been around for, for quite a while. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to be around uh, uh, again soon once this uh, pandemic uh, mania is over. Um, and uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, there were many, many things in, in, in both of the keynotes that were quite interesting and that made me think. And I, I took quite a number of notes <laughs> for, for me to follow up later on. I think what was quite interesting was uh, the Netflix, uh, Netflix example that uh, Gary talked about, because it also shows what really what innovation means and doesn't mean because innovation, I think for many, many people, when they hear innovation, they, they immediately think about something brand new, which is like out of this world and hasn't been there before. But I think in these days, innovation is a lot about uh, all those criteria that you mentioned, you know, and, and reinventing stuff and, and moving stuff from one realm to the other. Um, and that is quite exciting. That is happening a lot. And I'm sure that's uh, stuff uh, that we're going to talk about in the next 30 minutes. Yes, indeed, Stefan. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thanks for making the time. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. Last but not least, um, over to you, uh, Hugo, not from the TV industry. Um, please tell us more about your background uh, at Gameloft and, and your role. Yeah, hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me OK. Uh, OK, so I'm Hugo. I work at Gameloft, which is a, a big gaming company. Um, and I personally manage the user research team. So um, I worked in the UX field, which is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploding uh, since the last, I don't know, five or seven years, let's say. Um, I, most of my career is actually in games and in game UX. I've been doing this for almost eight years. Uh, my background is in neuroscience. So I'm uh, more on the uh, scientific side of things, more than creativity, even though I think both are uh, often linked. And uh, yeah, so I mean, my job is to uh, help the game developers uh, make sure that their game is the best possible. And by best possible, um, one of the key of, uh, aspects of that is to provide the best user experience possible and to uh, you know, avoid uh, unnecessary confusion or friction or frustration and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, so uh, we do research, we do testing, we do lots of interesting things that uh, maybe I, I will uh, develop later. And uh, yeah, the, the two presentations were super interesting. Um, but the first one, one of the key takeaways that I, I have was uh, the, the sell the problem thing. Uh, I think it's quite interesting <laughs> for me. Um, like, I think it applies both um, regarding the actual product that we do, like games. I think, uh, especially in the time of pandemic and people stay at home and stuff, like uh, the problem is that and, and people look to, ex to escape and uh, and, and that's actually a big problem. And like one of the key solution uh, beside Netflix, Netflix is also games, right? Uh, and, and I think also that um, selling the problem as a communication um, weapon or tool, I don't know. Uh, I think it helped me a lot as well when I actually developed the UX research team at Gameloft. Uh, when I started there like three years ago, there was no team and it was quite, you know, hard to get things uh, well, starting up from the ground up and, and actually saying this problem that there are problems in our games that we don't really know uh, the source of and the cause and stuff uh, was, uh, was actually, I mean, helped me <laughs> basically, uh, yeah. Very good. So welcome everyone and thanks again for your time. We we spend the next 30 minutes talking about uh, innovation, communication um, and so on and so forth. So ladies first, Jen, I'd like to start with you. First question towards your direction and we'll pick up directly where Garrett also ended with his examples. Um, I, I was stuck with Nokia, the very first example, right? Uh, unfortunately, an ex example that failed when it comes to innovation. Um, and potentially also misunderstood the meaning of what innovation really means, right? So let's turn this around in, in a positive way. What does innovation mean to you, Chen? And, and how do you make the leap from status quo to full on disruption at the zone, which you're doing, disrupting the market? So, yeah, I mean, I thought long and hard about this one because <laughs> like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's been one of those kind of things I shy away from on, on innovation, not thinking I was creative, but what it really means to me was 
it's about questioning the norms, right? Questioning norms, not accepting that status quo, pushing the boundaries, not only just big ones, but small ones too. And, and really getting that collaboration and creative problem solving going on in there is, is what it's, it's come in and in, in involved in my what kind of world. So for me, it's, it's asking kind of everything that I'm doing and, and, and I'm seeing is, can we do it better? You know, can we add more value to that product or feature? Can we solve a customer pain point in a different way that's more natural and, and more adoptable? You know, it's, it's, you don't even think about it by doing it. It's just, it's, it comes second nature to you. I think to me, those, those are the things that, that drive innovation um, in my mind, at least. Um, as to how we've been doing it in DAZN, I mean, we, we, Drawer touched on it in, in his talk about freedom. We have this, this, this freedom to bring up ideas, to run with those ideas and to even fail with those, you know? So a nice test and, a test and learn kind of atmosphere. Uh, I've been on a couple of things where, you know, we, with the new market launches, how do we, how do we test our product in other countries when there are DRM issues and you can't see the content because you're in the, in the UK, but you're launching in Japan and Germany? You know, how do you do that within your system and, and not add, you know, a huge security risk to it, you know, and it was connecting the dots of going, wait, what do pirates do, you know, for, for streaming their content? They use VPNs, you know, to, to access contents outside of the regions. Let's work, work with a VPN company to bring that together for us and use it in our way so that we can then access all our countries that were out there and, and use it in a, in a way that, you know, can allow us, our partners, our right holders actually see everything that we're, we're processing and delivering to our customers. So it's, it's, it's allowing those things to happen and that freedom to happen, but it's hard because you get to that point of busyness where it gets too noisy and, and, and it's trying to find that balance between delivery, 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 and trying to innovate and be better uh, on there. So we're trying, we're, we're doing well, you know, and I think we, it's just a learning journey for us as we keep on, you know, trying to find out new ways to disrupt the industry. Very good. That's, that's, that's an interesting example using the, uh, how the pirates do it, right? The VPN thing. Um, uh, Stefan, uh, I, let's stick with, uh, with, because you're from the same industry or, or at least some of your experience as the director of innovation at Sky former. Um, what do you see as success factors to really and truly become an innovative company, in your opinion, maybe also connected to the five elements that Garrett mentioned when it comes to innovation? Yeah, if that would be the secret recipe, <laughs> I would be happy to share it. I think the, the simple answer probably is uh, you have to try to stay ahead of, ahead of the game. Um, um, and ahead of everybody else to be innovative in some way or form. But as I pointed out uh, earlier in my introduction, there are such a large variety of definitions of what innovation really means. And there's so many different flavors and everybody has a different understanding. So there's a large spectrum of different people which a diverse understanding of what the meaning of innovation is uh, to start with. But we, you know, we don't want to make this too complex, of course. I think uh, you know, we heard a lot of, um, of uh, key factors already and, uh, and, and, and the factors that Garrett was talking about certainly uh, come into play here um, in an, let's say, in an ideal world. But then if you, if you look in, in the daily business in your company, then the question is how, how much freedom do you really have? And, 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 and you know, certainly, you you have a certain level of creativity and so on. But I think what you always have to keep in focus, and that might be a little bit of that recipe, is uh, um, you know uh, the customer, of course, at the end, is uh, who is deciding uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, and to predict that is very, very difficult. We heard a lot about Julius talking about data and uh, in, in campaigning. You know, I think we are still a few steps away uh, in, in that regard when it comes to predicting our, uh, the next innovation and stuff. And we all are aware of, uh, of uh, uh, great ideas that still flopped. And on the other hand, uh, we've seen unimposing ideas that turned into a worldwide phenomenon uh, with nobody really uh, planning for it. Uh, so uh, the, the whole innovation, uh, innovative approach uh, is, is really just a game at the end of the day. And you can only try 
uh, to make the best out of it by, again, by just focusing on what your consumer really wants uh, as much as you can do that. Then, of course, we must all not forget that the world we live in today is so fast moving compared to many, many years or decades back. You know, if you remember the beginning of television, uh, people were thrilled to get a television and then they were quiet for, and they were thrilled for a decade or so. And then you throw them the color television and they were, they were quiet for another decade. But today you have to have something new in whatever you are offering uh, at least on a yearly basis. I think we even we even faster uh, in the meantime because people get uh, bored quickly and they're just really constantly asking for something innovative, whatever that means. And if you don't bring that to them, then they will just lose interest and move someplace else. So it's a very, very tricky, tricky world. It's uh, at the same time, it's very challenging. It's very exciting to be part of that uh, rather than, you know, to be part of that uh, once in a decade kind of innovation, uh, at least for one industry. Uh, but um, yeah, it's so hard to really say this is, this is the checklist uh, to come back to what Gary uh, talked about. Um, uh, this is a checklist that you have to follow um, uh, in order to make it a success. Yeah, I think it would be too easy if there would be one secret ingredient. Right. Right? We would all be millionaires and we would all be... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case. So um, yeah. you mentioned about that's part of the game, right? So gaming, that's uh, Ugo, I heard, right? So on your side, in your industry, or also in your role, how do you prepare for tomorrow? I believe that, I mean, the gaming industry is also, was already faster than the TV industry, right? And the turnarounds are quicker, but how do you prepare for tomorrow already today? Um, yeah, yeah uh, I mean, I, I, I really agree with uh, Jennifer and Stefan. Like, I think uh, in order to be able to actually actually innovate, you you need well, lots of things, lots of talents and, and boldness and stuff like that, but also just the right conditions, like even within your company, uh, you need freedom. Um, and you need the ways to express your freedom and, and fail as well. Uh, like Garrett said, uh, you know, the, the, the fear of failure shouldn't be there and you should be able to, to experiment. And so, um, yeah, I think, I mean, you're right, maybe, maybe the video games actually move fast and involve people fast and maybe faster than TV. I, I'm not an expert in TV, so I don't know, but uh, it's, it's possible. But also, I mean, um, some of the companies that uh, are out there like Gameloft, for example, are actually quite. I mean, they're not new. Like they're, they're still like uh, they, they're getting old. Like Gameloft, for example, is twenty years old uh, uh, this year. So um, some, I mean, lots of the the ways uh, we we used to do things are kind of out of date uh, now. And, and they, I mean, the, the top one management realized that. And uh, last year, they actually uh, launched lots of um, big, big projects that are uh, called transformation plans to actually really deeply transform and uh, I, I guess upgrade update uh, the ways we do things uh, to, to, to you know to to match the, the current market and also try to really um, turn ourselves to, to the future I guess so um, uh, so we changed the organization uh, at the top level so for example uh, it used to be kind of a, a a classic company so like you had the big marketing department and the production department and like the monetization department all kind of really clearly separated and in, uh, in, in that way um, and so one of the big uh, changes was to actually um, bring them closer together so they're managed by the same people and they they, they better communicate and they also uh, they're not that segmented anymore they're much more you know there's, there's no real differences between who does what and so this better communication goes with efficiency, I guess, um, in, in that. So at the top level, they change organization uh, in terms of the process where well, there were 40, I think, transformation plans uh, that like lasted around a year of review of what we do uh, at Gameloft. And it was, uh, I mean, it could be, uh, it could be about like, production stuff or tech, but also HR, uh, marketing. I mean, any, everything was, uh, was touched basically by this, um, this drive of, of uh, getting better at what we do and, and trying to, to be up to date. And uh, so, so, um, so yeah, so we changed. I, I, don't, I can't, I mean, it would be too long to actually give examples, but uh, 
Um, for example, about what I do, uh, the user research and user testing uh, and just the, the general user centricity uh, was really pushed at the center of everything that we do. Uh, because I think the, the top bosses realized that uh, uh, yeah, you need visionaries in the team to actually get idea and, and push towards the future, but you need to be sure that these ideas actually resonate and, and fit with, with the actual user uh, needs. So, uh, so the, the research and the testing were really pushed at the center of the development of the products. Um, and lastly, uh, if you look at actual product and how we monetize, uh, we also change stuff. So um, historically, Gameloft makes kind of big, uh, console-like games on mobile, uh, but the market is changing. Uh, it's getting huge with many, many new actors and also smaller companies making smaller games, but that monetize a lot. And so we try to, uh, to also um, move in this direction while still making big, uh, big budget games. We also make smaller bets with more, uh, you know, crazy ideas that we can develop super quickly and really test super fast on the market to actually be more agile. Um, and so uh, it's something kind of new for us, but it, I, I think it, it took lots of innovation and internal changes to get there. So uh, yeah. So it's basically in a, in a nutshell, it's user centricity, but also that you change the entire organization structure to, to foster innovation. Um, Garrett, the question for you that I have is also when we talk about organizational structures, also like purpose for organizations, something that's around for a while now. Have you seen, or I think there is some evidence, but why are purpose-driven companies more successful than others? Yeah, I think um, maybe we should um, think about first about people and then about the companies because it's all, it's all human-driven, you know? Um, because we as people, as person, uh, as human beings, we, we have a purpose too. We have a purpose to be on this planet. There's a word, uh, word I, I did not know it before because, this, and, and I looked it uh, up in, in deepl.com. It's uh, self-efficacy. I don't know. I, as a German, I didn't know that self-efficacy means I must feel that I can make a difference and then in the world, in my small world and in the whole world. And then, only then I'm happy. This is my purpose of being here in this world. Then I'm happy, then I'm inspired, then I'm motivated. And maybe then I could be a part of a, of a successful company. If you ask, for example, people in Silicon Valley, let's say at Google, at Facebook or, or at Dropbox, why are you uh, working here? I mean, it's fun to work there and it's not because it's hard work there. Yeah, if, they are, if you ask them, you always hear one word and the word is not purpose, but it's, it's close to it, it's meaning. If you ask them, why are you working here? Because here I have meaning. I have meaning for this company, I have meaning for my, my own life and I have meaning, a meaning, a purpose for, for being on this planet. And, and I think this is, this is the, the interesting part. And that is, that's it, give people, their actions, their daily business, a meaning. Let them change the world. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, any other thoughts from, from the panel um, on what Garrett just said? And maybe an, another, another uh, thought. Uh, what I found, found um, very interesting is that the three, uh, Jennifer, Stefan and, and Ugo, used one word. It's, it was, it's a game. It's a game. I mean, Ugo has to use the word because he is from the gaming industry. Uh, but it's, of course, it's a game. I mean, uh, I mean it totally positive, not negative. Treat them like, and treat yourself like a child. Let them play. Let them, let them be mad or let, let them try things out. Let them fail. Let them learn. Same applies to, to little children, right? And if you, if you take the keynote, I, 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 my keynote with the factors, every factor, um, it's,
whether it's it's creativity, whether it's collaboration, whether it's diversity, whether it's freedom, or what uh, the era culture, if you look and on a playground, you find children who are perfect in it. We know how to do it. And now we have to transform it, and that's not easy. That's right, and I don't have a recipe too. Then let's transform this in, in uh, transfer it in, in, in business. And like, like I said before, uh, Gary, I think that's exactly the problem that, you know, w w when I look at all your five factors, fully agree, you know, from one to five, no problem. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. if I try to map that into a typical kind of business uh, environment, then you see that uh, the pieces of the puzzle don't fit <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, exactly. But I think that's that's all what we what we currently are speaking. You know, for the for the industry at large, and for not only for the media industry, of course. What what is currently being uh, uh, tried to move forward with terms like transformation and change and what have you, mm -hmm. uh, and agile concepts and and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and um, but it takes time because again, at the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's the human factor which plays a, a, a massive role there. And uh, we all know best <laughs> how we like to stick to uh, uh, behaviors and, 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 and how difficult it is to of change, course. even though yeah. we like to change. Um, and then if you mix into that, um, the constraints that you have from the business as such, from the technology and so on, then it's a very wild and very complex mix, which I think most of us are struggling with these days. But again, I say it again, it, it's also nice to be part of that uh, uh, industry at this time because there's so many challenges and so many juggling going on that we have to have to look at. Um, but it will be interesting to see, uh, you know, how many Nokia's and how many Netflixes we will have in the end, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you're, you're, when you, you mentioned about games and how we all said games, it, it really resonated in there because I look at things almost like a Tetris game. You know? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you only get one or two lines. Sometimes you can get the multi four line Tetris box or even you know a couple of Tetrises in a row. And then sometimes it just comes in so crazy, you collapse and the game is over and you just got to start all over because you're like, wait, there's still hope. I can still try again and I can try something differently and keep on going. So to me, I always look at things it, weirdly as, as, as a Tetris game and, and how can I get those big Tetrises in my life, you know, to, to, to really kind of elevate it in, in, in ways and, and, and bring some more joy into it. Yeah, I agree. And, and Stefan, I agree too. It takes time, of course. But uh, as Julius also said, uh, you, you don't have to, to win the war for, for the next year, maybe just for, for a day. And to, to apply this to, to the culture of innovation, you can start with one tiny tool. Why not? It's, it's, not, it's not that you, you can uh, prepare for, for having uh, like the six or seven culture factor in one day, but you can, I think it's, it's also about communicating. If you start with one little tiny idea, you give an information to all the people outside. You tell yeah. them, okay, this is our pathway and this is just the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think um, to, to summarize a bit, this is, is really that, um, yeah, innovating on a, on a smaller scale, right? Um, being able also with the failure culture is also something that we heard because gaming, you can't win every game. No one can, no. right? Sometimes, sometimes the soccer team tries, but even they will, will try to lose one, one game or will at the end lose one game. So you can't win all of those. And, and I think that that is changing on, um, and also on, on a smaller part. I'd like to move a bit to communication um, and, and because we're having um, yeah, streaming TV and gaming experience, I also like to talk about engagement. Like what are the new ways on, on engaging, communicating with our users or your users? Um, so yeah, COVID-19 is also changing a lot of things. So Jennifer, this question will go for you. <laughs> um, it's also changing the sports industry and the way we watch soccer and, and lots of other sports um, and the yeah, streaming video consumption is skyrocketing at the moment. Um, have you seen any change in the way you're engaging with your customers um, or do you see any change um, in the last year or predicting in the next year on how the whole streaming and potentially also with engagement will, will change? 
Or is there something you can spoil them already? Uh, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, we've, I mean, COVID's been pretty bad. I mean, I've enjoyed it because I don't commute four hours every day to work anymore. So <laughs> working from home is amazing uh, for, for me. But what it has done, the, the plus sizes of COVID is, is that people are adopting technology at a faster rate than, than they ever have before. Just think of contactless was slowly coming in and now everything is contactless. You know, it, 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 when you go to the stores in that way, people are now watching streaming sports is behind doors. And the only way to really enjoy it is either by streaming or if, you know, that, that normal linear channel, but it's still a different experience in that way. In the early days of COVID, um, the zone really pivoted quite quickly on looking at ways to engage, you know, users while we had a dry period, a blackout of sports, right? So we had um, a deal that we did with a PDC live home tour where you had elite dart players using Zoom to, to play dart champions inside their house. You know, you had that. We, we looked at gaming and we used a Twitch, you know, off the shelf software that we adapted to our uses so that we could have a Twitch-like experience with archive content that we had in our, our catalog so that athletes could talk about these matches that they were in or other matches and give their experiences or takes on this archive content that we had already in the zone. So it's, it's kind of trying to figure out how do you use what you have now to keep people engaged until sports is, is back on. Now that sports are back on, uh, we're actually seeing an uptake like we've never had before. Usually summer's dead uh, in sports. You know, it's, it's the hiatus for everybody, but now we're, we're almost back to normal viewing viewerships with just more to come in the future. We're also looking at how do we, how do we switch from that lean back experience on the TV, right? Where it's kind of a passive experience of watching TV to that lean forward experience of being more engaged with where you, you, where you watch. So that's kind of where next year kind of looks like is how do we get more engagement from what you're watching and being more active user, watcher than a passive user in that. And one of those things is around social. How do you bring social into there? How do you bring the things that they're missing from the pubs and stadiums into your home? So, you know, just like Disney and Netflix are bringing out, we're also looking to bring out watch party elements to, to bring that social element in there. And then we're looking at more things in the future. So I think that's where the biggest change is gonna come from. Yeah, so that, that's very interesting. Anyone has other uh, uh, ideas um, coming up from the social point of view? Because I mean, we potentially just go into light lockdown in Germany pretty soon. So we might need to get some more social stuff happening while watching or, or, or playing. So Ugo, is there, is there anything in the pipeline basically on how to make gaming more social? I mean, it was always remote, but I guess if we're remote the entire time. So is there, is there something new from an innovation point of view? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, the, so gaming has been more and more social increasingly over the years, right? Uh, I think uh, from uh, the very earlier uh, days of gaming where just people gathered in front of the same TV and, you know, uh, we had like a, a split screen of, uh, of uh, Playing the same the same game on on the same TV and uh, then the online gaming took uh, off etc cetera, etc cetera. and then mobile obviously uh, you can play on the go and this changes uh, also the the experience um, and um, regarding the actual social interaction uh, like people make friends uh, online now and and you can see that. Uh, um, especially the new generation, so the kids, so uh, the kids of like, I don't know, eight to 12 uh, uh, are actually even, I mean, they don't really engage and, and have the same behavior that people like uh, me do. So uh, people in their 30s. Uh, so us working at game company, uh, we're not that old, but we already feel old, you know, watching kids play and how, what they do, because if you take games like, uh, Fortnite, for example, like lots of kids that play these games are like, yeah, eight to 12 or, or a bit more. And they just use it as a way to hang out. So they play the game, they also just chat and, and hang out. So lots of um, social interaction uh, take place there. And uh, with COVID, obviously, uh, it, uh, it, it 
it, it acted as a, a new playground, I guess, because it didn't have the real one. So that's, uh, I think that's super interesting. Very interesting. Any, any other uh, new engagement models um, while we're in the light of a full lockdown over the ne next month uh, that you foresee? Well, one, maybe one more regarding more like innovation. Um, so uh, I'm talking about gaming, but obviously this also uh, probably will, uh, will uh, impact other businesses. But um, um, so th there were many innovations in gaming that impacted the games and how we played and also who played. So, uh, you know, the, the iPhone revolution uh, brought mobile gaming uh, to everyone's pocket, especially it changed kind of the user types as well, where uh, in the past, most of the, you know, the, the cliche of the gamer of like males, like teen, teenager boys, or, or like maybe their twenties uh, that we don't really interact with people and stuff. I mean, that's not true at all. It wasn't that true at the time, but it's not true at all now because uh, lots of uh, studies show that most, uh, actually a, a majority of, what we call gamers are actually female now, and sometimes, and depending on the studies, but like lots of studies show that they're between their twenties and their forties actually. Uh, but uh, and so they play; they don't play the same type of games, but that they're there, and they also generate lots of revenue and stuff. So, um, the, the, you know, the the the, the perception you might have uh, changed, but that's another topic. Uh, but just so, yeah, there was this revolution of the iPhone and mobile gaming in general. Uh, then three G and four G. Uh, brought the actual mobility of things because you can play from anywhere with people and so you can done games even if you're not at home and you can play online if you're not at home. Obviously 5G uh, is going to uh, uh, bring this further even more because games are getting bigger and uh, um, the, the, the speed of network is going to change also esports which is a big thing and so you need you know the, the best connection to play esports obviously um, and now the, the next revolution that's coming just now is the cloud gaming which means that you don't you can play any game on any type of screen which is kind of crazy because uh, in the past uh, you know there were the big um, demanding games like uh, console and PC games, and you had the simpler, smaller mobile games. But now, uh, because the processing is actually in the cloud and not in your device, uh, you could play anything anywhere, which is really interesting because, again, um, not everyone has a, a gaming console at home, for example, uh, but everyone has a smartphone. So even in terms of market, this will probably bring lots of changes in the very near future. Very interesting. The, I mean, 5G is just ahead of us, so, so that's going to be a very interesting one. And that's also um, bringing me to the, the last part and also to already towards the closing is um, what are the key industry trends that we are all foreseeing in our industries um, uh, in 2021? Uh, you, you, you mentioned a couple of those already. Um, so maybe, Stefan, um, um, your, your closing statement, so to speak. What is the industry trend? What, is the, what are the new things next year that you foresee that, um, that, that will be great for us? Yeah, so on, on the one hand, it, it's, it's one of those crystal ball questions again. <laughs> but uh, I think for me, uh, what is really exciting and what will be most interesting in terms of trends is how much of all the stuff that the pandemic has kicked off now or accelerated in 2020, you know, and kind of what, what we saw here is necessity is the mother of invention, uh, uh, kind of, you know, how much of that will really be uh, uh, established in, in the long term. Uh, I'm not only speaking for the media industry here, you know, we heard about gaming and, and I think in other industries as well. So I think so far what we can say is that uh, in some way or form technology has been one of the heroes of the pandemic, if you want. Um, uh, and, and a lot of things which we like to uh, refer to as change uh, actually have, have just been things that have been accelerated 10 times or 20 times. Um, uh, so they were already in the pipeline, but now they had to happen really, really quick. So not only for all of us in the home office in terms of Zooms and stuff, which is not that much of a, a massive <laughs> introduction, uh, maybe just in the amount, in the amount that we have seen it, 
But if you look in the in the in the on the production side in terms of remote productions and stuff like that, so we have people now sitting in their in their living room or in their office and running entire television shows from from their home, and we're talking really full blown high quality uh, HDR 4K uh, uh, things here. So who would have thought, even though all of us were on the path in uh, to to that world, that that, that this will come around so quickly. Um, and having said that, uh, I think it's, it's really going to be interesting to see whether all that um, um, is, is, will go away as soon as the pressure is off. Unfortunately, as you just <laughs> uh, hinted, uh, the pressure is not uh, off <laughs> so quickly with another lockdown just around the corner. Um, but there will be the time next year, hopefully, uh, when when things will go back to whatever normal uh, it will be. And then we have to see how much of this will survive. OK, Garrett, your point of view. Yeah, I think um, crowd is key. We we need more and more people to to innovate, to, to go into the future. We need the, the help of the customers. Um, and because of, that's good for you, I mean, for the test birds, uh, because we have to learn from them. We have to fail. We have to learn from them. And then together with them as crowd innovation uh, projects, um, we have to bring up uh, new ideas. So I think crowd is or will be key in the future. Interesting. Thanks, Jennifer. I think it's going to be around the the CDN's network, the edge area, we have so much more traffic happening through our ISP providers, through the CDN's, you know, everybody's getting higher broadband at home. They're doing more traffic on the internet than ever before. How do we make sure that, you know, we, we manage that traffic and, and, and how does the industry change to be able to cope with that amount of traffic as it keeps growing? I think that's gonna be an interesting place to watch in the next year uh, to see if that, that keeps up with the pace of, of our consumption that we're, that we're doing in, in the world right now digitally. Very good. You, Ugo, any, any last addition from your side? You kicked off the, the, the trend analysis already. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, I was uh, maybe a bit too excited. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so quickly talking about games again, um, so, and, and maybe making a link to a uh, new type of usage and also uh, at home TV and that kind of stuff. Uh, one example that, that uh, strikes me is, uh, um, American politician, uh, Alexandria Ortacio Cortez, AOC. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, she streamed herself playing uh, a game last week, trying to engage people to, to actually go and vote. Uh, and she's, so first she's a politician, she's young. Uh, she's uh, probably not a gamer, but uh, she played that game that is uh, kind, of, kind of making the buzz right now uh, among us, which is extremely accessible, extremely simple to play and very fun. And she streamed herself playing it and super, I mean, while doing it for, I don't know, an hour or two, uh, she became one of the most uh, viewed channel on Twitch. Uh, so, so she had lots of engagement and traction and, and was able to, you know, to play and have fun and, and also hopefully uh, bring people to, to, to think about voting and go vote. And so, I'm really interested in, in, in this, like how all these different, you know, all the technologies, the gaming, the, the new ways of reaching people actually go together. I think it's a super interesting example. Thank you, Hugo. That, that is a very good closing remark and basically closing from where we started with the election, right? And US politicians um, talking about, um, yeah, communication and innovation. Um, we're a bit over time, so therefore, um, there are so many questions as always that I would like still to ask, uh, but there's only limited time. So um, thank you very much, um, Jennifer, Ugo, Stefan and Garrett for joining the panel today. Uh, I think we covered, this was fun. This was the first time we've done and hosted this in a, in a Zoom environment. So we, yeah, we all used to be to do this in a different way, but it was fun for me. I hope you also enjoyed it also uh, to our attendees. Um, thank you for joining um, towards Julius and Garrett, our keynote speakers. Um, thanks for making the time. Thanks for joining. Um, I have 
two key takeaways. Uh, the one is from Julius, um, win the day, not the year. I put this on a, um, uh, on, on a, on a, on a post-it um, very soon. Um, and yeah, Garrett, I, I think uh, the, the failure culture is something that um, I will also have as a takeaway um, besides all the other uh, many points that have been mentioned. And my last thanks goes to the team who have actually organized this today. So Caro, Fred, and Toby. I know there are way more in the background, but D3 were running the show um, today in the background. Um, thanks for support. Thanks for putting this all together. Um, if you liked it, then we're happy. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining everyone. And yeah, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.